Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here for the Nackamson Lecture. Thank you to the Institute for Work and Health for this invitation. I've been a great admirer of IWH for many years now. We have tried to create a little IWH within RAND to deal with public policy issues. And for the last 15 years, we've been heavily involved in a lot of changes in the permanent disability compensation system in California. And so it'll be my pleasure to describe a little bit to you about how public policy res research helped shape what was done in the state. So first of all, I'm an economist. And um, you may wonder what an economist has to offer to the subject of the study of occupational safety and health and workers' compensation. And uh, I thought that I would tell you uh, a little joke that I think will hopefully make that clear. I think that the issue is that we, we think about things a little differently. So the story is that there were three guys golfing. One of them was a priest, one was an occupational therapist, and one was an economist. My sister, incidentally, is an occupational therapist, so what happens in the story reminds me of a lot of what happens with my sister. So they got up to uh, the T, and they saw that the group ahead of them on the first hole was still on the green. And so they waited, and it seemed to be taking them a very long time. And finally they got through, and, and they, they golfed, and uh, when they got to the second hole, they found again the group was still on the green, and in fact seemed to have made less progress than when they walked up to the, the first hole. And so now they were a little annoyed. Things were slowing down more than they wanted. In fact, I mean, it, there was even some cursing and uh, some frustration. But they waited. They got through the hole finally. They, and so they, they went to the second hole and they golfed. And then when we got to the third hole, the group was still at the tee. And now they were angry at how slow they were going. And they marched up to the group and they looked and they realized that this group of golfers was severely visually impaired, blind. And the priest immediately said, oh, what have I been thinking? What have I been saying? I've been so unfair to them. They're God's children. They, of course, should have as much time as they need to golf. And the occupational therapist said, oh, I, I can't believe I've been so hostile and angry. They, of course, should be accommodated. They need as much time as they, as they want for this. And the economist said, none of this makes any sense. They should be golfing at night. We should lower the teeth, we should lower the greens fees for at night, so it provides incentives for the appropriate allocation of resources. <laughs> so, perhaps a dubious contribution. Hopefully we've made more contribution in the state of California to uh, public policy. So I'm going to describe, I'm going to describe now uh, what happened over the last 15 years. So before I uh, get into that, I'd like to make a comment about what is the role of public policy in forming public, uh, what is the role of, pu of policy research in forming public policy? I mean, obviously, those of us who do policy research would like to think that we can just give the answers to the policymakers and have them adopt them, but that's not how things work to our frustration and really not how things w should work. Public policy involves negotiation, involves balancing of conflicting interests, and so what typically happens is you have politicians, they stake out extreme positions, and then they negotiate to try and come to some sort of compromise. Hopefully by staking out a particularly extreme position at the beginning, the result of the negotiation will be in an area that's favorable to their constituency. So how does research fit within this? Well, research will put facts on the ground. And the politicians, the policy makers, have to work within these facts then. And it narrows the range over which there has to be compromise. And ultimately, by taking the extreme parts of the range off the table, pushes policy into 
a more productive direction. That would be my view about really what uh, public policy research does. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you four examples over the last 15 years from the state of California. I'm going to start with describing our work on what happens to injured workers with permanent disabilities over the years after their injury. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our work on the value of return to work. Then I'm going to talk about the targeting of permanent disability benefits. And finally, about issues that the state is grappling with now about, you can think of it as the substitutability of return to work and benefits as a way of delivering value to workers. So starting, first of all, uh, with uh, permanently disabling injury. This is back, I had first come to RAND. It's my first year at RAND. And the state was in the throes of a periodic crisis over workers' comp. And in California, permanent disability is a large driver of the costs. The claims themselves, the indemnity benefits were expensive, but what's more, these are the most severe claims. So uh, those claims are a huge fraction of the cost of the system. So there was a lot of discussion of having a reform. And in the context of the debates over the reform, you heard two very contradictory positions. On the one hand, some people would get up and they would say, we don't need any permanent disability benefits in California. What I've seen at my company is workers who are injured, they come right back to work at their previous jobs, and then they get a big permanent disability benefits. It's wasteful, we should just eliminate the whole system. Then you'd hear, on the other hand, no, this couldn't be more false. In fact, injured workers suffer significant employment dislocation and difficulty associated with permanent disability, and then the benefits don't even come near compensating them for their losses. So the state of California came to Rand and asked us, um, specifically this Commission on Health and Safety and Workers' Comp, which is an employer labor commission, which funds research that they then use to inform the legislature. And the commission asked Rand to do some research on what are the long-term consequences of permanently disabling injuries and how well are injured workers compensated after experiencing an injury like this. So what this figure shows you is a result that was in this initial report. And the figure shows you on the vertical axis quarterly earnings of injured workers. And then at the center, the zero point is the point of injury. And then it shows the, year, the, the quarters and five, up to five years before the injury and up to five years after the injury for a group of injured workers. That's the blue line. And then the purple line is a group of comparison workers. And the way we identified comparison workers is we had data on all workers in the state. So we found workers who were working at the same firm at the same time the injured worker was injured, making the same wage. In fact, we found up to five for every injured worker. And then we followed the two groups over the years prior to the injury and over the years after the injury. And the sort of clear result here is that at the time of injury, there is a significant drop in the earnings of the permanent disability claimants. And then over the following five years, really their earnings on average never return to what they would have made had they continued to be on the earnings trajectory that their comparison workers were on. Incidentally, talking about sort of issues of dispute and then how data can show that uh, a myth is not true. Another thing we heard was that if you find a worker at an at a employer at the time of injury making the same wage, that injured worker was a malingerer even before their injury, and you could see that they will have had low, they will have had no way would they be matched up to just any worker that you find within the uh, employer. But in fact, we found an extremely close match and then a uh, separation that was never eliminated over the years after the injury. So what were the implications of this for benefits? Well, California actually already paid one of the highest benefits in the United States. And um, nonetheless, because of the large earnings losses, it turned out that the benefits still were not 
able to replace as much of the earnings as some other states that we later were able to compare to. And it had, this was driven largely by a exceedingly low return to work rate and exceedingly low continued employment among the injured workers. So California initially said, well, clearly we need to improve return to work dramatically in California. And then another debate started. And similar to the first debate, now with some facts on the ground where we know that they actually are injured, a new debate emerged. And they said, you know, return to work programs are really better than benefit increases because it's a win-win. Both the employers gain because they keep a valued employee and the worker gains because they can keep their wages. And on the other hand, we heard others saying, these return to work programs bring workers back to work too soon. Often they put them in positions elsewhere in the company where there's stigma associated with what they're doing and they're more likely to get re-injured. In the long run, they're going to be worse off. So the state of California asked us then to start a program on return to work and evaluate that. So let me show you some data, first of all, just to suggest the importance of return to the ad injury employer. And what this figure shows you is the proportional earnings losses. So this is the losses, the earnings losses as a proportion of the comparison workers' earnings for a group uh, for injured workers, and it's shown for each disability rating group. So this is to try and control for the differences in severity. And if you look at all PPD claimants, you can see uh, how that looks, where it's approximately, for the 1 to 10 group, it's about a 5% earnings loss. And for the 81 to 90 group, it's about a, over 60% earnings loss. Um, now, if you were to look at the workers who are at the, observed at the ad injury employer one year after their injury, what you'll see is that they have significantly lower earnings losses in every rating group. And if you look at the workers who are at the employer two years after, lower yet. And in fact, three years after, lower yet again, such that in fact, benefits were largely adequate. In fact, replacing almost all of earnings losses, and in some cases even more than the earnings losses, for the groups who were still observed at the ad injury employer three years after. Now, what we'd like to be able to do, ideally, seeing looking at this data, is move the workers who don't return to work into the group of workers who do return to the ad injury employer, but that's not how, that doesn't necessarily work that way. It's not clear that they'll experience the same thing. And the state wanted a more causal or more rigorous way of evaluating this. So what we did is we sampled a group of self-insured employers, and we found out that there were some that had implemented return to work programs over a particular time period, and others that hadn't. And we knew the point at which they had implemented the return to work program. And we had data on all of the workers who were injured at all of these employers and their earnings over the years before and after injury. And what we were interested in looking at is what happened at the firms that implemented return to work programs? Did workers at those firms experience significant improvements relative to what was happening at the employers who never changed anything? That provides us with a, a comparison group. And we found quite striking results. First of all, the median time to sustained work, where we define sustained work as observing them having earnings in two consecutive quarters after their injury. The median time to sustained work was reduced by 47% at the firms that implemented return to work programs. And we also found that, in fact, rather than having an increased likelihood of injury, in fact, there was a 10% lower likelihood of a subsequent claim. And then finally, at five years, the differences between the workers injured at firms with return to work programs and those without was largely gone. But in between, the workers who were at the, worker, at the firms with return to work programs experienced significantly lower earnings losses and therefore had more adequate benefits 
And interestingly also, we found that the savings in temporary disability benefits more than paid for the cost of the program on average. So clearly, an opportunity for policy consensus here, a true win-win. In fact, so those who said it was a win-win turned out to be correct. So, so here's a situation where we now agree on return to work. But at the end of the day, there still is going to be losses. And we can't bring everybody back to the ad injury employer. So how do we do it? Well, there are two approaches, sort of broadly speaking, two approaches to doing this. There's one approach, which is often called a wage loss approach, which is something like what is done here in Ontario, as I understand it, where you are paying workers as they experience losses over the, the, you pay them compensation over the years after their injury to replace what was lost as a result of their injury. Alternatively, there's the disability rating approach, which at the time that they are at permanent and stationary, you get a rating. That rating is seen as a prediction of their future earnings losses. You pay them their, what is expected to be their future earnings losses, and you close the claim. And you don't, want, you don't monitor them anymore at all. Well, people think that the wage loss systems are far more equitable, but there's a significant concern that's raised that they discourage return to work, that if you're getting a benefit and if you go back to work, you get a lower benefit, that this may in some way encourage people to stay out of work. So California used a rating system that where they tried to do everything they could to have an accurate prediction of the future earnings loss and were hoping that they had the best of both worlds, that they would have a good prediction but at the same time provide no disincentive to return to work. So the state asked us that, okay, we know we don't want to increase non-employment among injured workers, but how does the system do? Does it target appropriately? Well, I already, I think, gave you some sense of that. Um, the standard rating uses only medical information, and the final rating uses age and occupation as well. And the main result that we found was that for both the standard and the final rating, you have uh, what they call vertical equity. People with more severe injuries got higher ratings and therefore higher benefits, and that's equitable. That's what you want a rating system to do. But what we found was that there was very troubling what they call horizontal equity. So if you look at two workers with different injuries and the same rating, do they have comparable earnings losses? And so what we found was that, no, in fact, that wasn't the case. And there were certain injuries that consistently were receiving lower ratings and therefore uh, were, or another way to think about it, certain injuries, given their rating, were consistently experiencing higher earnings losses. In this case, in this figure that you see, the shoulders. Shoulder injuries were consistently undercompensated by the system and by a dramatic amount. Interest, interestingly, the um, disfigurement had the highest rating for given earnings loss, which is a way in which you can see how the values come into how these rating systems are constructed. Even though it was intended to measure the loss of ability to compete in the labor market, without any data to back it up, biases about these different injuries crept in over time. So what we recommended is that this is not 1917 any longer. We have a world of massive amounts of data and computing power and look at the research studies that we've been doing here at RAND over the last few years and for that matter, you know, looking at IWH, they've done comparable studies. Um, and uh, so we recommended adopting an empirically based rating system such that you look at what injured workers are actually experiencing with certain impairments and you set benefits such that they are, the ordering is correct across injuries. 
And we also recommended that you, and the, the nice thing is we, you can therefore have the equitable benefits of a uh, wage loss approach, but without the disincentive effects of the wage loss approach, given the importance of return to work. In the end, our recommendation was, I'd say partially adopted in 2004, and I won't go into the details, but they added something called the future earnings capacity adjustment, which took the previous system and essentially adjusted all of the ratings so that they were consistent with the data that had come out of our studies. Um, they also made a plan such that this would be updated every five years, and I think this is a particularly exciting aspect of it, but five years has passed and they didn't update it. <laughs> and, um, but the idea is that if you have the data directly built into the system, this creates sort of a self-adjustment, which um, allows for the system to be dynamic and self-correcting. So in particular, then, the idea is that this starts to incorporate data al analysis directly into the policy parameters. And that's what, I'll, to return to this at the end, I could see as sort of a future where, where public policy analysis and public policy research is directly incorporated into the system on an ongoing basis. This new reform in the, this context adopted these changes in the rating system. It also moved over to the AMA guides. As it turns out, the ratings and the AMA guides were approximately half of the ratings in the existing California system. And no attempt was made in the legislation to change the system that converts ratings into benefits. So automatically, all the injured workers in the state had a one-half benefit cut, essentially. Now, some people said at the time this was not expected, but it was well known pretty quickly into it, and it was clear that it was probably intended. There was nece it was necessary. It's important to note that it was necessary to significantly reduce the costs of the system um, because we had the highest employer, the highest costs to employers in the state at the time, and by a fair margin. Through this adoption of the AMA guides, there were very dramatic benefit reductions. But there were a number of things that were intended to improve the equity of the system and also a number of, of changes that were made to increase return to work. One in particular was something called a two-tier rating system. They changed it so that if an employer offers return to work to a permanently disabled worker then uh, at a reasonable wage, then they would be allowed to pay a lower benefit, what they called the bump down. And if they didn't offer return to work, then they would be forced to pay a higher benefit. They called that the bump up. And this was intended to, therefore, the, the employer would see savings by offering return to work, and you'd see a lot more return to work in the state. So here's the context where there's been this significant reduction in benefits, but also a lot of return to work incentives and a belief that now more workers were going back to work. So the question became, yes, there's been a reduction in benefits, but is it possible that the return to work incentives have offset those benefit reductions? And in fact, we've made everybody better off. We've moved it from a compensation system to a return to work system, which everybody agrees is a better system. So the state asked us to evaluate what happened. So what we found over the years since the reform was that, indeed, there were pretty significant increases in return to work. And this shows you for the lowest severity cases where we'd measure severity using medical costs. After SB 899 was adopted, there is uh, important increases in the, the fraction who are at work for the medium severity, you see similar increases, and in many ways, most impressive, for the most disabled, the increases in after-injury employment were quite significant over this time period. So what this implied, remember we're talking about earnings losses here, this is actually just the earnings received from work. Over this time period, there was quite significant declines in these earnings losses from at its high, highest, about $50,000 over 10 years, down to about $10,000 less. So there was 
quite a bit of scope to reduce benefits and to and that would you know essentially keep workers whole still so we also did a simulation in this figure as you'll see there were a lot of co changes in composition of the sample so this is a simulation of what would have happened had return to work stayed at the rate that it was early on and then you can see that the way in which cumulative earnings losses have dropped was driven, driven not by changes in the composition of the sample, but almost entirely by the improvements in return to work. However, unfortunately, we also found that these benefits cuts still led to a very substantial decline in replacement rates. From approximately 45% in replacement rates are the fraction of losses that are compensated by benefits. From a, from a height of 45% over much of the early 2000s down to almost 30% by the end of the time period, suggesting that you know, workers were, were experiencing a significant reduction in the adequacy of their benefits. And the one thing we can say is that the situation would have been far worse had there not also been an improvement in return to work. So, well, going back to the question we posed, does improved return to work, can improved return to work substitute for benefits? Well, I mean, it clearly can, to some extent. The two, uh, there was a lot of good things that you can say about the, the uh, 2004 legislation. Um, it significantly lowered employer costs from being the highest in the country to being about halfway, but the median. Um, and injured workers experience very important gains in post-injury employment. But benefits in California, which were arguably inadequate prior to the reforms, were uh, even less adequate after the reforms. So today, the state is grappling now with considering legislation to try and address these issues. And the question that they're trying to face is, how do we improve benefit adequacy without raising employer costs by too much and more important, importantly as well, sac without sacrificing the, all these gains that we had in post-injury employment? We don't want to dismantle the, the new system because it has made some very significant important improvements in the way things work. To conclude, um, we've seen here, I think, that policy analysis can improve workers' compensation in many different ways. Um, as I described at the beginning, and with all four of these examples, we set up sort of differences in opinion that were later resolved and the debate moved on to new issues in each case. It reduces the range over which compromise is needed. It puts facts on the ground that lets the policymakers turn to the next issue. It also is useful in identifying problems. We even gave some examples of debunking myths. And importantly, it's useful for evaluating reforms as well. But in my view, and I think using the example of the rating system that we had recommended, simply providing public policy research to policymakers is really, I think, only the beginning. Part of the issue is, in almost every state, and I'm sure it's, you know, that I'm aware of, I'm sure it's true here too, um, there is uh, a crisis reform cycle in the United States, where it's only about every 10 years that the legislature has the appetite to reform the workers' compensation system. And by the time they get to it, all the legislators have never even thought about workers' compensation before. And an enormous amount of new ground, uh, of old ground, really, needs to be covered. And so you have these huge reforms, and then everybody wants to ignore it for the next 10 years because they've got to move on to other things. I think there are opportunities for incorporating data and analysis directly into policy parameters with constant evaluation, providing constant feedback to the administrative systems in ways that allow them to make smaller interim changes that would be a, a better approach in general than the way we do it today. This convergence of public policy research and public policy, I think, you know, is a, a, a promising future for workers' comp.